Welcome back to Wood Engineering. I'm Jeff Orochko from Carleton University. And in this video, we're going to continue our discussion of bending strength for our lumber and glue lamb beams uh, and focus on the calculation of lateral stability factor for lumber. And lateral stability factor is KL in the equations that we saw um, in the previous video. Okay, so um, for lumber beams, you know, usually we're talking about joists in a floor or a series of beams all together supporting the same kind of load. So, um, you know, typically we want to design these to be as efficient as possible. And so we don't really want our design to be limited by our lateral torsional buckling. This lateral torsional buckling effect, we don't really want to see that because when we have that effect, it provides a KL less than one and it's going to reduce the strength of all of our beams because those beams will be lateral torsional buckling, laterally torsionally buckling, instead of failing in a section failure where I get tension or compression failure in the top and bottom. So that would not be very efficient generally. So um, for lumber, generally we would like to design something where KL equals one. And to make that simple, 086 uh, provides a number of criteria depending on the aspect ratio of our beam that will um, that will make it so that uh, we can actually use KL equals one. So as long as we follow these criteria um, and the criteria relate to how the beam is restrained. So we always have to restrain the beam at the ends from rotating. And um, in addition to that, we might also restrain the beam from moving laterally at uh, specific places along the length, either from other joists framing into it or from uh, some decking plywood or something on top that actually prevents the beam from rotating. And so um, we're going to talk about what the detailed requirements um, for that are. And I mean, one of the primary um, parameters that divides those beams into categories is the depth to width ratio. If we're looking at this member here, this certainly is the depth. And this is the width. Of course, if we have a beam that instead of sitting vertically like this is sitting on the flat, then we will never have a problem with KL because we cannot have lateral torsional buckling of a beam that is uh, sitting on the flat like that. It can't buckle sideways. It's always just gonna go down and fail in section, uh, moment section failure. But of course, we don't like to design beams like this because it's not very efficient because the beam this way is much, much stronger than a beam this way because the moment of inertia of this beam is many times higher than the moment of inertia of this beam. So usually our beams are arranged like on the screen here. So the first criteria is that for all beams, all criteria, whether I use these simplified criteria for um, making sure that KL equals one or whether I'm actually explicitly calculating the, the KL for a beam, I always need to provide lateral support at points of bearing to prevent deflection and rotation. Okay, so here I'm drawing a kind of simplified figure of some joists sitting on some bearings so you know this is some sort of bearing surface and this is some sort of bearing you know top plate of a wall or something like that and i've just kind of drawn it these these joists as if they're 2d just so i can show what the restraint conditions are so these these which are bending like let's see if i can get the right direction here you know something like this um sitting on top of some restraints here um, how do I have to restrain this? And I always have to restrain it like this, um, regardless of what my other conditions are. And what I have to do is I need to provide restraint top and bottom at every bearing location. So here I have two bearing locations. And so that means that I'm going to have to restrain this beam top and bottom like this. So I have to provide some kind of mechanism that's going to 
stop movement in the directions of the red arrows. So the red arrows are where I have to hold the beam so that it uh, can't move. And so these restraints are there to prevent, first of all, to prevent lateral movement at those locations and also to prevent rotation. So if I'm if I am restraining it like that, top and bottom, let's look at it like, like this. I'm restraining it at the top and I'm restraining it at the bottom. Now this beam cannot, cannot rotate, like it can't go like this anymore because I have provided a restraint at this location and at this location. So what might that look like? Okay, well, I'm not going to win any awards for my art, but um, this uh, kind of restraint could be uh, something that's called a joist hanger, which is a piece of light gauge steel shaped into a kind of shoe that sits around the beam and holds it up on the bottom and also provides some sides that prevent it from rotating. Okay, um, so there's like basically a part on the bottom which I am kind of showing here, right down here, it goes underneath the beam. And then, um, so the beam sits on that, the joist, and then it also prevents it from rotating. That's a joist hanger. Uh, obviously for glue lamb, it's gonna be a different kind of, um, different kind of detail to provide that restraint, but there also has, there always has to be some kind of restraint like that, that keeps it from rotating and from moving um, laterally. Okay. So um, now we're going to get into the details of the requirements for KL equals one for lumber. And there are a number of different cases and which case you need to satisfy depends on your depth to width ratio. So something that is, has a very high depth to width ratio like this ruler, I mean, it's so skinny, like you can't even really see the width is going to be much more prone to lateral torsional buckling than something that looks like this, where here my depth to width ratio is about uh, something like two to one, 2.2 .2 to one or something like that. So it's a much wider relative to tall. So this is gonna be much less likely to have lateral torsional buckling than um, this one. So that depth to width ratio is one of the key um, parameters that we use to um, separate the beams into categories for what kind of restraints you need to provide for KL equals one for lumber. Okay, so there are a total of five categories in the standard depending on depth to width. So the first one is for a depth to width ratio of four to one. So the first one is if my depth to width ratio is less than four to one, just like this one, this one's 80, 89 deep to 38 wide. So that's about two point something to one. So it's less than four to one. Then the only requirement that I have is that I have lateral supports at the point of bearing, just like we've shown above. And I'm gonna show again below just for total clarity about what this would look like. Okay, so in elevation, I have a beam supported at two ends, say one that was simply supported, for example, and I need to provide lateral restraint uh, at these points indicated by the red axis to prevent it from going out of plane. And if I looked at the top of that in plan, then it would look something um, like this. So I am basically preventing lateral, uh, lateral movement um, at each end. At top and bottom, so it prevents lateral lateral movement, and uh, since it's top and bottom, it also prevents rotation. So this is, this restraint is required in all cases. In this one, and you'll see in every other one, I'm going to say and lateral support at points of bearing because that's required. And if I calculate it using the glue lamb clauses, I still need lateral support at points of bearing. Okay, here's the second one. <laughs> 
Okay, so second cri second category allows a more slender beam, deeper versus width, five to one now, as long as I have lateral supports at points of bearing, which was my previous requirement, and the additional requirement that the bear that the member is held in line by purlins or tie rods. I'm just gonna show kind of an example of what that might look like in the case of purlins, which are just like smaller members sitting on top of our beam. So you see here, we have all of the same restraints that we had before in terms of the vertical restraint and the out of plane restraints uh, shown by the red X's. Uh, on top of that, we have some purlins that are sitting on top and these purlins are connected to the top of our beam, for example. And they go all the way across uh, the top of the beam and um, they have the effect of restraining the top of the beam from moving laterally. Not super well, but enough to justify having a deeper section. So now the uh, third criteria, which is deeper still. So this one, we can have an even more slender section, 6.5 to one, as long as we still have lateral supports at point of bearing, and also the compression edge is held in line by direct connection of decking or joist space not more than six, 10 millimeters apart. So this is a better restraint. Um, and um, what this might look like, here's what it might look like for joists. Okay, so these are some joists framing into the side of the member and the distance between these joists is less than or equal to 610 millimeters, that's two feet. So now the compression edge is better held in line because it's kind of being held um, by the side rather than just by um, purlin sitting on top. And if we're talking about decking, it might look like this. Okay, so some decking sitting on top. Those are cross section. I'm not drawing the X's because the X's are gonna be so small, but basically we have decking sitting right on top. Um, and that decking is obviously connected directly to the beam. And uh, so this better restraint gives us a better depth to width ratio of um, a higher depth to width ratio of 6.5 to one. Okay, on to number four. Okay, so this is the case where we have all the requirements of D. So uh, we have um, joists connected to the beam or we have um, um, decking. Okay, actually it more applies to the case where we have decking because if we have joists, um, there's not really anywhere to put the bridging between. So basically we have some decking or sheathing attached to the top and then I'm gonna show what blocking looks like and what bridging looks like. Okay, so on the left, uh, we're looking at blocking, which is, um, I have, you know, this joist, this is what I'm designing here. And if in between these, I have blocking, then basically I put a short piece of wood and I nail it in here in between two adjacent beams that I'm designing. So I would have another one over here and another one over here as well. And in the out of page direction, those blocks would be spaced not less, or sorry, not more than 8D, where D is the depth of uh, depth of the beam that we're designing. Um, and then bridging, it's very similar. Basically, instead of putting blocks, I put just smaller members and I arrange them diagonally like this. Okay, and then I'm gonna have the same thing in the adjacent bay and here as well. Okay, and these are pieces of wood here, both of these. 
And um, in both of these cases, what's happening is we are preventing at that location, we are preventing the lateral torsional buckling because I have a block here or I have an X bridging right here, which prevents that from moving over. Basically the top of this one is bridged or blocked to the bottom of the adjacent one. And as we know, when I have lateral torsional buckling, it's mostly the top that moves, not the bottom. So if I bridge against the bottom of the adjacent beam, then I'm actually prevented from turning over. And you notice this in bridge design too. Steel bridge design, you know, if you have steel girders and stuff, sometimes they use X bridging like that to prevent lateral torsional buckling by bridging against the adjacent joist. And the same thing is happening here. And blocking is the same as bridging, except we're just using a solid member. And, um, you know, if any of you have basements or your parents have basements, then um, since we don't have gypsum on the roof, uh, you'll commonly see this kind of detail um, to, um, to increase the efficiency of the joists by making KL equal one. Now, of course, in a house, usually that's gonna come from the MBCC part nine as a prescriptive requirement. But um, if we're doing it in the engineering way, then um, this is directly how it affects our strength. So blocking or bridging will help to restrain the beam. And the very last one, which is the highest degree of restraint, allowing the highest depth to width ratio. Okay, I can have a kind of extreme um, depth to width ratio of nine to one, uh, less than or equal to nine to one, as long as I have, again, lateral supports at point of bearing and both edges held in line. So top and bottom are both restrained. One uh, example of this is kind of maybe a typical floor like you would see in residential housing construction where you have a um, some joists and you have a plywood um, subfloor or OSB subfloor on one side and on the other side you have for example a gypsum um, ceiling finish. So here I will not need blocking as long as these two are held in line then um, I can have nine to one. And of course, these need to be connected together by um, nails or for gypsum, it's probably screws. And um, yeah. So next, um, what happens now if I have these five different sets of criteria, A through E, which I, I can find these listed out in the standard as well. It describes them in the same kind of detail, but just without the pictures. Um, what if I don't fit into this category, in any of these categories? So if I don't fit into one of these categories and therefore I don't automatically have KL equals one, then I can still use the beam. I just am gonna to have to calculate my KL manually using the gypsum method, um, which we happen to be discussing in the next video.